And we're live. All right, wonderful. Thanks everyone for tuning in and joining us. My name is Catherine. I'm with the MSU Science Festival. Um, we are well into our Ask a Scientist digital exploration as a part of the Science Festival. Um, and we're so excited that you're here joining us today. Um, next, we have Dr. Artemis Spiru. Um, she's here to talk to us about um, astrophysics. So welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Could you tell us a Thanks. little bit about yourself, what you study, and what you um, are here to talk to us about today? Sure. Thanks for, uh, for having me, and thanks for organizing this. This is great. Um, so actually, if you don't mind, I have some slides that I prepared, so it's it's for me easier to, as a professor, to kind of show some slides and explain what I do better. Perfect. So let me share my screen. Can you still see this? Perfect, yep. Okay, so you can also find my information there if, uh, if you need to contact me if you have questions later. Uh, so yeah, uh, as you can probably tell from the accent, I was born somewhere else. I was born in a little island uh, kind of south uh, east of Europe, which uh, is called Cyprus. I did my undergraduate studies in physics. I majored in physics uh, and I did that in Greece, in the northern part of Greece, right there, Thessaloniki. Um, and then I moved to Athens, Greece, and that's where I did my PhD in nuclear physics, nuclear astrophysics, and I'll tell you all about that uh, in a second. And in 2007, that's when I moved to Michigan State, uh, and I've been here ever since. So I was a postdoc for a couple of years, uh, and then went through the ranks, assistant professor, associate professor, and now I'm professor. And I also was the associate director for education for a while. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of my path. Um, I can jump right in and tell you what I do. Uh, my So as a professor, I teach. And so I have students, I have undergraduate students that I teach and I have graduate students that I teach in the classroom or uh, they do, we do research together. And so they get trained to do research. Um, and uh, on the research side, my field is called nuclear astrophysics. Uh, and it's the, the most common question I get, how do even these two fields uh, connect to each other? Nuclei are tiny, they're very small, and stars are the biggest uh, things we, we know, so in galaxies and so on. Uh, so how do the two connect to each other? And the answer is actually pretty simple. It's that everything we see around us is made of nuclei, and we'll dive into that in a little bit. And that's also true for stars. And stars are not just made of nuclei, but they also make new nuclei themselves. And this is exactly what we're studying in this field, uh, in this field of nuclear astrophysics. We're trying to understand how in the process of a star getting bigger or in the end, maybe it explodes. In this whole process, there's a lot of nuclear processes happening, nuclear reactions happening. There's a lot of nuclei that are involved. And so all of these just create more and more elements. And that's why, why I have the periodic table of the elements down here. All of these elements, except for the lightest, the hydrogen and the helium, but everything else is made inside stars. And this is one of the things we're trying to figure out is how all of this works. And so this field is kind of a complex field because you have to understand the stars themselves. And that's where astronomy comes into play, the observations you do with the telescopes. Um, then uh, the astrophysics comes into play because you have to create a model that describes all of this. And then uh, the nuclear physics come inside in here because you have to do experiments that, uh, that can help you understand how this model works and how these processes work. Uh, and so my part in this whole field is nu the nuclear physics part, and I'm an experimentalist. Uh, so I do, I design experiments and I design devices that will, uh, detectors we call them, that um, can study all of these nuclear processes uh, the way they happen inside stars. So I wanted to, so I, I work at the facility for rare isotope beams uh, or FRIB, and and so I wanted to kind of 
say a little, a few things about what even that means, because we talk about facility for rare isotope beams. There's a lot of unknown words, even the, the title. And so I wanted to jump uh, to explain a little bit about what we're doing there. Uh, so in the picture here, you see Katerina. Katerina, I have two daughters and Katerina is my youngest daughter. And Katerina happens to have a lot of different elements in her body, but mostly all of our bodies mostly have uh, water in them. So if I zoom into Katerina's hand over there, zoom very, very, very much, then you can see all the, the water molecules just uh, uh, floating around. And water is made, uh, no, you know that, is made of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So each little Mickey Mouse head that you see over here has uh, an oxygen, and that's the red part, and has two hydrogens. Um, but this is not yet what we study. So I'm going to zoom in even more and just zoom into one of those oxygens over there. And this is the, what an oxygen atom would look like. Uh, now, it doesn't look exactly like this. It's just a picture that we create to just have an image for it. But it has electrons flying around in these orbits that you see, those lines that you see around. And then it has a central part, which is called the nucleus. And I'm going to zoom into that even more. And this is actually what we study. This is exactly what we study. This is the, the, nucle the nucleus of the atom. And so a nucleus has two parts. It has neutrons and it has protons. I colored my neutrons here yellow and my protons um, green. Uh, you can color them whatever you want. They don't actually have color. Um, and, uh, and so in an oxygen nucleus would have six, uh, sorry, eight protons and eight neutrons. We'll come back to, to those numbers uh, in a second. But before we do that, I wanted to just get a sense of the scale because we're zooming in, we're zooming in, and it's not easy to kind of get this sense of the scale. So if we assume Katerina is about one meter long, about three feet, about one meter long, then if I uh, check what my water molecules, how big they are, they are about a billion times smaller. Just again, to, it's hard to wrap our heads around that. To try and understand that, I have down here the example. If we take one of Katarina's hair and check how big that is, that is about uh, this 10 to the minus four meters. It means 10,000 times smaller than a meter. So 10,000 smaller times smaller than Katarina. So the water molecule that we're talking about is another 10,000 smaller, 100,000 smaller, even smaller than that. Um, then if we go to the oxygen atom, the atom is a little bit smaller than the molecule. It's not that much smaller because the molecules are made of atoms. But if I zoom into the nucleus right at the center of the atom, that is a lot smaller. That's another 100,000 times smaller. So if, you, if I would draw that atom that I'm showing over there actually to scale, uh, then that central nucleus would just be a tiny little dot on my picture. You couldn't even see it. So the picture we have on the atom is not completely accurate. It's just a way for us to, to see what it looks like. Okay, so this is kind of just to get a sense of the scale, but we haven't even tried to introduce any of the words that I'm trying to introduce for the facility for rare isotope beams. So let's try to do that. So if I take my oxygen nucleus over there, here it is. It has eight neutrons and eight protons. And this one I would call oxygen 16. The 16 comes from summing up those two numbers. Eight plus eight is 16. Now, if I would just add one more neutron to this nucleus, there it is. You can play spot the difference here and find where's the extra neutron. It's actually right there at the front. And so now I have nine neutrons and eight protons. And this is still oxygen. And the thing that makes it oxygen is this eight protons over here. So it's still oxygen, but now it's oxygen 17. Nine plus eight is 17. So it's a different oxygen, still oxygen, but it's different. And I keep, sorry, I can keep going. I can have 10 neutrons and now it's oxygen 18. I can have 11 neutrons or I can go on the other side and make them so, uh, less neutrons. So I can have seven or six neutrons and you can actually expand in both directions. 
we have studied all the way to oxygen 28. That is a lot of neutrons in oxygen 28. Um, so all of these versions of oxygen, we call them isotopes. So an isotope for a particular element, it has the same number of protons. It's the same element. These are all oxygens, but they all have different numbers of neutrons. Now you can say if there are oxygens, why do we care how many neutrons they have? And if all we care about is their chemical properties, then that's true. We don't care about how many neutrons they have. But if we care about their nuclear properties, they look very, very different. So if I, I, have, I use different colors here because these three here at the center is what we call stable isotopes. We find them on earth, we find them everywhere. They are in Katarina's body and every uh, other person's body. Um, the other guys out there, oxygen 14 and 15 and 19 and all the others, they are not stable. We call them rare. And here's the other word, it's facility for rare isotopes. This is what we're studying. And they are rare because they don't live for very long. If you look at how long these guys live, oxygen 14 only lives for one minute. So once we create them, create that oxygen, uh, after one minute, it just decays, it becomes something else. It gets transformed into something else. Oxygen 15, same, takes two minutes. Oxygen 19, even less. 26 seconds. And actually, the further away you go from these stable isotopes here, the shorter they live. If we go all the way to oxygen 28, it lives for very, very, very small time. We cannot even see, we cannot detect. Now you can ask if they live for so little, what do we even care about them? Well, going back to the astrophysics that I was talking in the beginning, uh, Inside stars, these isotopes do exist inside stars and they play very important roles. They produce energy that is uh, released in the star. They help to create new elements, to go to heavier elements. And so all of these are very important in trying to, to understand how our universe works. And because we can't find them on Earth, then we have to make them. And this is exactly what we do at our lab. We take stable isotopes like the oxygen 16 or 17 or 18 here, and we smash them together to make something that is rare, like oxygen 14 here or even uh, or other isotopes. And this is what we do. So I want to continue now and tell you a little bit about how we do this. So the first thing you have to do is get one of these stable isotopes that you can find everywhere. It can be oxygen, oxygen 16, but it can be anything else. It can be calcium. We find calcium in our bodies, right? In our bones. Uh, it, can be, it can be anything you can imagine, anything you can find on earth. And then you get it through machines that are called accelerators. And those make things go very fast. And in this picture, I have two machines that are called cyclotrons and they get those stable isotopes and they make them go around and around and around and here. Then you get, take it to the bigger cyclotron and it goes around and around and around. And every time it goes around, it goes a little bit faster and faster and faster. And so by the time it comes out of the second cyclotron, it goes really fast. It will go around the earth four times in one second. That's how fast it goes. And you have to make them go that fast because then when they smash on the other material, they will smash hard and they will break into pieces. And out of these pieces that are coming out, maybe one of them will be this rare isotope that we're looking for uh, and maybe not. So you have to do this as much as you can. Uh, and sometimes you create other stable isotopes that we've seen before. And sometimes you make these rare isotopes. And so all of this thing, this smashing part is happening over here. And the rest of the facility is we're trying to separate the ones that we care about from the ones that we don't care about so that we isolate the ones that we want to study, the rare ones that are exciting. Um, and then we guide them down, down all of these. These are pipes. You get them down all these pipes and you get them into your experiment. And there you study different things. You see what, uh, what happens when they will uh, decay, when they transform into another nucleus. You see how they will react to each other, the way they would react with each other inside a star. Uh, so these are all the kinds of things we're looking for. 
Um, the, now, this is the, what we have right now. This is the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab, or NSCL. And this is a facility we're running right now. It's been running for a long time. But the even more exciting thing that's happening uh, now at Michigan State is that we're building a new facility. It's so close to being done. It's only a couple of years away from being done. And this is the facility for rare isotope beams that I talked about before, or EFRIB. Uh, and it's the same idea. You just want to get some stable isotopes go really, really fast and have them smash on something else and break into pieces. And you select the, the rare ones that no one has ever seen before. And you want to select those and study them for the first time in our lab. The difference here is that instead of having the two cyclotrons that I talked about before, now we're replacing those with a bigger and better machine. And this is a linear accelerator. In the picture I have here, it shows you the linear accelerator. So you would start with, um, with a beam somewhere at the center and it goes around a couple of times. And then at the end of this, it goes really fast. First of all, it will go very fast. And second, you will have a lot more of these stable isotopes. And the more you have, again, the more they will smash and the more you produce at the end. So this is what uh, the new facility is doing. And so you, we will have access now to so many nuclei that we've never seen before. Uh, like right now, we have discovered about 3,000 isotopes uh, across the, the whole nuclear uh, landscape. Um, theory predicts that there's about 7,000 that exist. Who knows, maybe seven or maybe eight, depends on the theory, but there's a lot more that are predicted to exist. Well, what EFRIB is going to do is give us access to 1,000 more, so we now, have seen about 3,000, well, EFRIP will give us about 1,000 more. That's a lot of new isotopes that we've never seen before. Uh, and this will be a world unique facility. People from all over the world will come here to do their experiments because this will be the best place to do these experiments. So we're very excited about that. So this is kind of what I wanted to do in terms of the, the science. I could stop here and answer a few questions if you want, or we can move on with the demo. Um, sure. Uh, we have um, just a couple questions at this point right now, um, and then we could launch into the demo. Um, yeah. I, I have a quick question first. I'm just wondering, this is incredible research doing um, that's being that's taking place, excuse me, at MSU. Um, other other facilities like Cyclotron or EFRIB um, anywhere else in the US or other places in the world? So there are a few, just a, a handful, not very many facilities around the world that can do this, this science. The, the leading facility right now is in Japan. The, the principle of making these rare isotopes is very similar to what we have uh, at, uh, at NSCL, um, but they, they've uh, upgraded their facility recently. And so right now they're more advanced than we are right now. And when FRIP is ready, then we will be, uh, we'll, will be at more advanced than they are right now. So this is kind of how it goes in, the, in terms of competitions. In the US, there are a few other facilities that do nuclear science. Uh, there are different principles, not exactly the same. Uh, so the I would say that EFRIP is the, the facility for rare isotopes for the whole country. It's incredible. Um, and then we have a, a question from one of our audience members. Um, Gianna wanted to know um, if, did you get interested in nuclear science first or astronomy first? Could you talk a little bit about your inspirations um, and how you, how you got here? Sure. Um, so I don't know, as a kid, I was not one of those kids that said, oh, I want to be an astrophysicist. I probably didn't even know what an astrophysicist was uh, when, uh, when I was a kid. But I liked math and I liked science. And I kind of, since I liked it, I decided to do more. And that's, it was just a simple decision to go and major in, uh, in physics. And I wanted to teach physics. That was my plan. I was going to be a physics teacher. Uh, but going to, to the university and starting to do all these courses in physics and diving more and more into different things, I discovered that I like nuclear physics. It kind of, the, the whole history of the field and how things connect to, to each other, it just, I, I like that aspect. 
but I also liked astrophysics and I liked the um, um, kind of the big questions of how the stars work and how where we come from, where all the elements are coming from, these kind of things. Um, so I was very excited to discover that there's a field that combines both nuclear and astrophysics. Um, it was being staying more on the nuclear side was more because I like hands-on work and I'm, like, I'm an experimentalist and I like the fact that I could design experiments and I could uh, do my experiments. Um, the experiments we do are relatively large, large scale, but not huge that you would need 20 years to design and do one experiment or experiments. Uh, you can design and run it and analyze the data and all of that within a few years. Uh, so I like that that aspect. And so that's why I stayed more on the nuclear physics side, but still answering the big questions that I was interested in. That's wonderful. Um, well, we have um, just under 10 minutes left of the session. Um, do you want to jump into the, the demonstration? And we sure. Can... It's, okay. a, it's a short one. So let me introduce it first. So I talked a little bit about how we have that uh, beam uh, particles going through our accelerators um, and it's it's hard to imagine you have these tiny tiny little particles and now you have to guide them through the different machines in the cyclotron they go around or they go through these tubes and then you have to guide them to your experiment um, and so I wanted to just do a demo that uh, that presents that so what I, I said you're going to need was something that you can make static electricity if you're familiar with the term uh, like a balloon or a plastic cup or plastic spoons or something plastic that you can if you rub on your, on your shirt or on your hair you it will make your hair float this is what we're looking for um, and you can use your kitchen faucet just have a little bit of running water doesn't it take a lot uh, i am not going to use that i prepared a little setup with a cup uh, first, because it was just fun to prepare something. And second, because you can see that a little better. And so I have a cup with a hole uh, and I put a little bit of blue color in my water so you can see it better. So let me switch to that. Okay, can you see my setup here? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, I'll take off now. You still hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So here I just have a cup. Uh, I have some um, pipe cleaners over here. That's how I'm hanging it from uh, just a piece of string. Um, and I have just another cup full of water and I put a few drops of blue, blue coloring in here so you can see my water dripping. But you can do it so easily with, at your kitchen faucet. You don't have to bother with this. Uh, but this just makes it nice. So what I'm going to do is fill the cup with water. There's a hole here, so you will see water uh, coming down. And then I have another cup. This is where you can use your balloon. Somehow in a house with two kids, we managed to not have a balloon available. So I'm using alternatives, but you can use uh, a cup uh, or you can use plastic spoons. All of these things work and we'll play with all of them. Um, so if you have your balloon or your plastic cup, what you can do is just rub it or just do it on my hair. You can do it on your clothes, but I just do it on my hair like this. And what happens when you do that is you're putting charges, you're charging it up uh, just here on the surface. And then we'll see how these charges affect our water. This is the plan. So I'm putting water in here. This. I'm charging up my cup. Close. And there. You can see the nice beam of water or stream of water. It now gets bent because of the charges. We can do the same with the spoons. And you can play with it as much as you want. You can kind of make it come this way and then have it come back the other way. And just do, as you can see here, you can make it bend and bend again and so on. You can drill different size holes on the cup and then see how those get affected. They're affected more, if they're affected less, and so on. So this is just something fun to play with. 
Um, and I will switch to this side to maybe explain a little bit how this works. And the, the physics behind this is not exactly the same as what we have with the beam. Uh, the water is a molecule that has a positive and a negative side and the, the, it turns around when you put the charge close to it. The beam that we have in the, in the lab is already charged. And so, but if you put some electric field, some charges close to it, it will turn left and right. And so we use this kind of technology to guide our beam through the beam pipes uh, or the different particles will get uh, affected differently. And then you can choose, you can select the ones that you care about and ignore the ones you don't care. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we'll post um, all the materials and a recap on how you can do this at home in the comments section after this presentation for everybody watching. Um, we do have a couple questions in the comments section. Um, Amanda's curious about um, secrecy in, uh, at FRIB. She's wondering um, if the experiments are posted for the public to learn about um, or if they have to wait a while for them to be analyzed. How can people learn more about what you're doing? So everything we do is basic research and we are funded either by the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy. And so everything we do is uh, public knowledge. Nothing is secret uh, at the lab. You can come and take a tour at the lab and you can see uh, all of our equipment. You can talk to us and we're happy to share. We go to conferences and give talks about what we do. And then we publish, as soon as we are ready, we publish the results. Um, and there's different ways to publish. So typically we'll publish in scientific journals and those are what we call peer review, reviewed. So an expert somewhere else in the world will review the, the publication we're writing and decide if this is good enough to, to publish. But we also try to, to publish in a, in a language that people can understand, you know, not as technical. Um, and so then we would post things on our website and we do press releases and so on. So we have different ways to communicate, but yeah, nothing we do is to great. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question. Um, someone's wondering how long does it take to smash and analyze one atom? Mm, that is a very good question. So when when our atoms or our, our nuclei are flying through the beam pipes, they go really fast, as I, as I said already. So within a few nanoseconds, that's uh, a billionth of a second, um, the, our nuclei will go from where the accelerators are to where we do our experiment. So if a nucleus leaves even for a little bit, it will make it into our setup to detect. Then when we, we detect this, Particles, we detect them kind of one at a time. And so again, within a few nanoseconds, we have that good of an accuracy uh, to separate them out and say, okay, this is my oxygen 18, this is my oxygen 19 and whatnot. And so we can separate them within these timescales. And then it depends on if I want to see how it decays, how it transforms into something else, then I have to wait for its lifetime and that is specific to the nucleus. I, I cannot, that's nature. I cannot define that. So if something leaves for two hours, then I have to implant it into my setup and wait for a couple of hours for it to do something. But yeah, in terms of the, the production and so on, this is really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, we're unfortunately out of time, um, but thank you so much for joining us. This was really wonderful. Um, I want to encourage everyone to keep asking your questions in the comments section. Um, we'll be there to answer any questions you have after this session. Um, thanks again. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, take care. Bye.